Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. After learning all the details, the husband decides to take a responsible step, but what? Today's final installment of a story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! Jimmy immersed herself in working with the group, dragging me along with her when I wasn't busy. Everyone was scared to death doing their first play. Jimmy didn't play in it, she was listed in the program as an assistant director. There weren't many people in the audience at the first show, and I think they were disappointed. I promised them that next time it would be better. They put on a children's version of Into the Woods next. Jimmy told them what a wonderful cow I was, and they dragged me in to play the role. The lead role was played by a 16-year-old girl who stole the show because she was so good. The room was full because one of the corporate sponsors, McCoy Investing Incorporated, purchased all the tickets and distributed them to the community. The applause at the end of the performance lasted 15 minutes, and I made sure that every woman in the production, including those backstage, received a bouquet of roses. Everyone wore their suits during the post-show meet and greet. I was in the head of a cow when a little girl, about seven years old, ran up and poked me. Moo, she laughed. I answered her with a playful moo, which caused her and her friends to laugh even more. Since Jimmy was in the play, I invited Celeste. She had come home from filming one of her shows, and I thought some normalcy would do her good. She showed up with a network executive, and he was in the middle of making fun of the production when she hit him in the stomach. He took the hint and behaved himself. After the show, the party was held in an ice cream parlor, in deference to the children in the production. The local newspaper made a big deal out of it, and they had to extend their run for another week. I think there were no empty seats in the hall, and everyone paid for the tickets. I came from a meeting about something that might be my next project and found Jimmy and Celeste at our kitchen table, barely holding a bottle of wine. They giggled about her date at the play. When she saw me, she grinned. This was our first and last date. He should have gone in a suit. He can be a jerk. After they stopped laughing, she told us that the only reason he came with her was to try to lure her away from our production company by promising her immense fame and fortune if she signed a contract with him. Jimmy asked, what did you tell him? I told him that if he kissed my fifth place at noon in the food court of our largest shopping center and gave me time to advertise, I would think about it. He left that night, she said. Jad got me involved in my next venture. She frequented the bar that had been a landmark in her hometown for years. The owner had died, and his widow did not have the strength or skill to support it, so she put it up for sale. Jad wanted me to partner with her and revitalize the place. I didn't have much to do, and the bar owner wasn't on my resume yet, so I agreed to check it out. Jimmy and Celeste came with me, and within 15 minutes, they were laughing hysterically. It turned out it was an alternative lifestyle bar, a mix of gay people. Despite Jad and the manager, we were all noticed within 30 minutes. The place was huge but had seen better days. I could see the potential, but not necessarily in its current incarnation. After talking about it with the owner in her office, we went in search of Jimmy and Celeste. Jimmy was on the dance floor with a very attractive woman, and Celeste sat at a table full of guys taking shots. They recognized her from her performances and were determined to entertain her. Jad took the opportunity to introduce me, and I found myself at a table with three ladies. One was a very attractive blonde, shorter than me. Another was a really hot dark-skinned woman, as she called herself. Whoever did her surgery was a genius because her breasts looked very natural and there were a lot of them. The third was a Latina with classic curvy hips, waist-length hair, and small breasts. She saw me looking and laughed. I know my breasts are tiny compared to these big ones, but I'm on hormones. Don't worry, baby, you'll love them. We were far enough away from the DJ to have a conversation, and they did a good job convincing me about the potential of the place, how a refurbishment would help, but most of all, they wanted to turn it into something more than just a bar and hangout spot. They talked about inviting fashion experts, booking exotic dancers to work for their audience every three months, and even sponsoring sports teams. We are the perfect target. All of us gay people almost always have good jobs, and very rarely do we have children, so we have a lot more free money than most. If only we had a place where we felt safe and comfortable, think how much of this money could be in your pocket. The little blonde did most of the talking, and I found out that she was an accountant, 
which made me pay more attention to her. All three had skills and contributed to the conversation. We were so immersed in it that we didn't notice the girls approaching. Jimmy sat down next to her and smiled. Surrender, girls. He's mine, and I'm not going to let him start experimenting. The Latina smiled. Don't automatically dismiss this opportunity, honey. I play for both teams, and we could have a good time together. I didn't have time to blush before Desiree intervened. Turn me on, girls. Amy, the blonde, added, What am I, minced meat? Include me in this little pile. I was beaming, and Celeste was banging on the table and laughing so hard. One of the guys following me jumped up and said, Forget about these ladies, sweetie. Let me show you what real intim is. We ended up combining three tables and having a party. The DJ turned on the music, and I had to dance with everyone, even this guy. They must have bribed the DJ because every time I walked onto the floor, a slow song would start within a minute. I just accepted it. This will make a great story someday. Thank God we didn't have to go back to the hotel. I barely remember getting into bed. The next morning, we all came out of our bedrooms and just looked at each other. Not a word. Can you hear me? Not a word about last night. The ladies grinned. Jihad grinned wider than anyone. I won't say anything, besides I have a lot of photographs. Celeste was holding her laptop. I wouldn't bother. Jihad, this place is Facebook, and we mention them everywhere as possible owners. There's a really good photo of Roy dancing with Chuck. He looks absolutely adorable, snuggling up to Roy, doesn't he? We all crowded around, and she wasn't lying. There were photographs of all of us. Jimmy danced cheek to cheek with Desiree, Celeste at the guy's table while they all tried to kiss her on the cheek at the same time, and Jod kissing a Latina. We all agreed that we were out of town and doubted that any of our friends were connected to the club. After breakfast, Jod asked me what I thought. It has some potential. You know, you're wealthy enough to buy this place on your own. Why do you need me? I need your knowledge. This could be a gold mine, but most of all, I need your luck. I'm not always lucky. I'll take the risk based on your track record. I would love to do this, but I will not go forward alone. We ended up forming Junner Enterprises LLC and buying the place. Remodeling the bar and opening it turned out to be more work than we thought, and for a while, we were there once or twice a week. It was too far to commute, so we always spent the night. I asked Jimmy if she would be jealous because I spent so much time with Jod. I think you're safe, dear. For weeks later, we were almost done. The grand opening was scheduled in two weeks. We left part of the club open so that our visitors wouldn't forget us. Most of the regulars came every Thursday to get an update on the renovations. I got lucky when we found out that Desiree was an interior designer in real life, and we hired her as a consultant. I told Jod about this, and she just grumbled. I told you you're lucky, Jimmy, I said. It was difficult for me to devote enough time to each person when I wasn't busy. She was in the theater group, the new season was starting, and she was engrossed in helping them choose the plays they wanted to produce. Jimmy wanted to direct the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but was quickly rejected due to the conservative nature of the community. Celeste was going to participate in the old group on a limited basis because she was leaving to film the next series of shows for Home and Garden. They worked a tight schedule, trying to fit ten shows into five weeks. The club finally opened at full capacity. It was crowded, and they started turning people away quite early on, giving those who couldn't get in a gold pass that guaranteed them priority entry the next time they came. The pass included a free first drink. We hired Tina, a Latina who used to be a man and whom I met on the first night, as a manager. It turned out that she had a degree in hotel management but was having a hard time finding a job in her field. I insisted on a security team, five men and three women, all trained in their fields. Two worked at the club, two patrolled the parking lot, and one watched everything on the monitors in their small office. Everyone was connected and could come together at any time in the event of an incident. Tina thought it was too much until two bouncers drove away two cars with men intending to make an example out of someone. After that, she didn't say another word. The club also had good relations with the local police. 
two of the security guards were retired police officers, and the office always had hot coffee and snacks, usually homemade from one of the clients. Over time, when the frequency of police calls almost disappeared, everyone relaxed. I stopped by my accountants for my annual review. They estimated that I was worth about $4 million, but most of it was invested in various endeavors. They estimated that my fortune would double in four years and be settled in ten. I thought about it for a few days and decided that now was a great time to take a break. My thoughts were that now would be a great time to start a family. Jimmy surprised me with a couple of things. She wasn't as excited as I thought she would be. She was home almost full-time for a while and wasn't particularly keen on having children. She was 34 and I was 38 and I saw our window of opportunity closing. My world started to fall apart. A month after I attended a show and saw a familiar face in the crowd, it looked like Jack, but the guy disappeared before I could get there. Then I looked at the program and saw another familiar face, Philip. His bio said he was a local businessman and former professional actor who enjoyed performing in amateur theater productions. My health worsened when I joined Jimmy after the performance. She read my mood and remained silent, never leaving my side. I didn't bring it up until we were on our way home. So, when were you going to tell me that Philip joined your troop? He hasn't been with us long, honey, and we never cross paths. If I find out he's in a play, I skip it and work on the next one. I have to remind you that nothing happened then, and nothing is happening now either. It will happen. I didn't tell you because I knew it would upset you. You know, I think I saw Jack in the audience. Maybe he and Philip moved in together to save money after their divorces, and they seem to enjoy living together. Similar lifestyles, I guess. I spoke to him once and told him to stay away, and we'd get along. Please don't worry. I'm a grown woman and can take care of myself, and I try to never be alone with one of them. She sounded convincing, and although we had one of the best evenings afterward, I couldn't stop thinking about them. She started spending more time at work. I asked Bob and Jan, and both said the firm was preparing for an important presentation for a client with national coverage, and everyone was trying their best. I noticed that she never left her phone unattended and seemed to guard it like gold. When you put it all together, and add to that the unusual amount of time she spends preparing for a new play, I got a very uneasy feeling. I went to a detective agency and talked to Major, that was his name, based on his rank in the army, and since many of the employees were veterans, the title stuck. We spent some time alone in his office, and he sighed. Are you sure you want to go down this path, Roy? Everything you've told me seems to have a reasonable explanation. If it's all paranoia on your part and she finds out you've been testing her, she'll be very unhappy. I thought a lot before making this decision. Major, if you have time, look into it, okay? The easiest way is to hack her phone. If you can get it for me, we'll probably outsource most of this because she knows me and a lot of the staff from our parties. Remember, she interviewed most of us. When did they do that murder mystery thing? Do you have a time frame? A week or two should be enough. I don't know how much it will help you, he sighed. I'll start tomorrow. When can I access her phone? I had to think. The only time she didn't have it was when she was charging it. Can you send the guy after midnight? That's probably the only time I can get to it. Tomorrow night he can do it from his van, it'll be faster. Feeling like an idiot, I was convinced that she was tired. She snuggled up to me and immediately fell asleep. I waited an hour until she turned over, then slipped out of bed, carefully took her phone off the charger, and walked out the patio door. I was a little shocked to find him sitting there in the shadows. He didn't even go back to the van. He plugged his phone into his laptop and worked at the patio table. Almost immediately, he quietly said, Damn, she has anti-burglary encryption installed. It's quite complex. Can you get me your laptop? I carefully crept back into the house to get my laptop. He took it into the van, hooked up a couple of cables, and worked like crazy before leaning back and sighing. Done. I caught him and reprogrammed him so he'll never show up again. I need your phone. I handed him my phone, and he did a few things before handing it back to me. You have a tracking app and remote viewing software installed. What does that mean? It means you need another phone. Someone cloned yours. 
Everything you're texting, everything you say, every business transaction you do over the phone is communicated to someone else. Crap. This could be really bad. I conduct most of my business via phone. Don't touch yours and try to limit confidential conversations. Use it enough so as not to arouse suspicion. I'll have a new phone for you tomorrow afternoon that will be as secure as possible. By then, I should be able to tell who's receiving your information. What should I do now? He shrugged. Put things back the way they were and go back to bed. Try to sleep if you can. Don't change your usual habits. If she wants to snuggle, snuggle. If she wants to play, play. If she ignores you, don't get aggressive. Just go with it. Remember, we don't know what we're dealing with yet. She may be involved in something shady, but she can remain loyal to you. We need to find out who the players are and understand what the game is. If I don't finish tomorrow, I'll finish the next day. Don't call us, we'll call you ourselves. You're still a shareholder, and it won't be unusual for us to tell you that you need to come look at some tables and discuss the idea of expansion. Surprisingly, I slept like the dead. I didn't succeed in business by hesitating. If I found a problem with something I was investing in, I confronted it head on. I was sad to think that the most important investment in my life was about to be worthless. They called two days later. Jimmy heard me answer the phone and asked what I was talking about. Major wants me to come and talk about expansion. She grinned. Let me guess, he found a new way to peek through windows to get details? I smiled and looked at her as I answered. Nobody does that anymore unless the client wants live pictures. Almost everything is done via computer and social media now. Most agencies worth hiring have one or two people who can break through security codes and firewalls faster than a squirrel can crack a nut. No, Major doesn't need help in that area. He wants me to consider adding a personal security department, bodyguards, escorts when it's not safe for a man or woman to be outside, extra security for the club if there are a lot of famous people present. This kind of thing can be very lucrative. They have everything ready for the presentation, and knowing Jason, there will most likely be a PowerPoint presentation. Would you like to go? She winced. No, that sounds really boring. Besides, I have a guild meeting. I'll probably be late. I surprised her with my answer. Haven't you been late lately? I won't wait. What? I left the house before she could continue. Major met me at the door, and he didn't smile. Jason put on his headphones, and when he looked up and saw me, he handed me a pair. The first thing I heard was a voice, JY, no fun and games tonight. Guys, Roy is a little annoyed about the time I'm spending here. I can only justify it to a point. A male voice, later identified as Jack, began to whine. Damn, I was hoping for some fun tonight. I still remembered Philip's voice when he spoke. Calm down, Jack. We can wait. We're almost there. When we get there, we'll all disappear to the Cayman Islands for a very nice life. Jason turned off his headphones. I cloned her phone and had full access. Every time she speaks in person or on the phone, it is recorded. He grimaced. She talks a lot. I had to set a filter so it would only activate after keywords. Then she revealed some of their plans, and I had to take it down. Now we have to listen to every word. My ears hurt. Let Major continue. I knew the man wouldn't sugarcoat it, and he was right. She's sleeping with both of these guys, at least one other guy, and two women. We have names and bios of all of them except the last male lover, but we'll know that by tomorrow. I was stunned. How? Why? I thought she loved me. She loved you. I think she still does, just a little. From what I understand, she doesn't want to ruin you, but she wants all your cash, including the trust fund you set up in case of divorce. Here you go. There was now $300,000 in the account, plus about $40,000 in her joint account. My investment capital was just over $600,000, so if she got everything, it would be almost a million. A million is a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not something that will last her a lifetime. I told this to Major. It looks like you influenced her. She wants to invest money in a donut franchise. 
She intercepted a call from the owner who wanted you to invest and checked it out. She even visited him under the guise of an advertising agent. Your wife and her lover seem to think this place might be a gold mine. She's ruining our lives for donuts? Seriously? Jason joined the conversation. Her lover seemed to have convinced her that you're having an affair. With whom? With Celeste Richards, Jody Halfway, and Amy Rogers. They even say you all have an intimate together. I sighed. Damn, I'm a busy little beaver. I haven't slept with Celeste or talked to her other than on the phone in five weeks. Jody is a woman lover, she's not intimacy attracted to men. Amy is an ex-man and an accountant at the club I invested in. And before you ask, I'm not inclined to be in that kind of relationship. What should I do now? Major smiled a smile that probably terrified anyone he interrogated. Now we're getting hard evidence. The conversations we recorded are illegal and can never be used, but we can use them to track their movements and be there when they meet. Then we'll take photos and audio recordings, and your marriage contract will be complied with. I don't think it will take long. You need to leave for a couple of days soon. We also need to install audio and video recorders in your house. I don't think they are stupid enough to do this at your place, but you never know. Tomorrow is Thursday. You could do this while she's at work. I'll tell her tonight that I have to leave on Friday and may not be back until Sunday. She already has a motive, it'll just give her an opportunity. I am back. What else could I do? Luckily, I was home long enough to take a sleep pill that I sometimes used when traveling and I was practically passed out when she came home. Jimmy climbed into bed but gave up pretty quickly when I didn't react. I lay there wondering how many more nights we would spend together as husband and wife. I told her I would leave around noon to head to Cleveland. What the hell is in Cleveland? A security service that is losing money due to poor management. Major is coming with me to evaluate the personnel. We should be done with interviews by tomorrow, but it may take until Sunday. There was a little irritation in her voice. And you're just telling me about this now? I shrugged. I didn't know about this until last night. It was brought up in a meeting. It could be very lucrative, and it's only two days. You know what? Let's plan a vacation for next week, somewhere warm with sand and alone. I heard that the Cayman Islands are nice, and we haven't been there yet. I feel like we're growing apart, and I want to make sure you know how much I love you. She winced at the mention of the Sea Islands, but quickly recovered. Maybe we can get the same bungalow and just forget about the world for a few days. Looking her in the eye, knowing it would never happen and lying about it, was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. After she left, I packed my things for Cleveland. Major and Jim met me at the airport. He was already planning the trip pending my agreement, so I actually went to Cleveland. We arrived and quickly finished things off, contracting three men and one woman for a year. They didn't even have to move, if they liked Cleveland, we could just email them the details, and they could come at the appointed time and place. When we arrived at the hotel, Jim smiled. Leave your phone in the hotel room. You won't stay, but your phone will make it look like you're here if anyone checks. One of the new operatives will come around 7 and take it with him while he has dinner at a very nice restaurant at our expense. Then he will wander around the city center aimlessly for an hour before returning it to your room. If she calls, it will automatically be forwarded to your new phone, and she will never know. I winced, glad he was on my side. We found ourselves in a very pleasant country resort. When we went down for dinner, I was shocked to see Celeste, Jody, Bob and Jan from the ad agency, Rick from the production company, and Chef Jean at the table, almost everyone I was involved with through business was there. I looked at Major. We're all connected to you through business but more importantly, through friendship. This is a show of solidarity, Roy. You don't just invest in businesses, son. Your strength is your ability to invest in people. We are all with you no matter what you decide to do. I was touched. Before I started getting into business, I was a fairly introverted person without many friends. I could look back at that table and know that even though we were connected through business, they were here as my friends. Celeste held one hand tightly and Jody the other. After a few minutes, Jody cleared her throat. What do you need us to do? Well, I definitely appreciate a few empty shoulders to cry on later. 
As for the rest, Jim is in control. Everyone looked at him. They are planning a big party after the play tomorrow. According to the intercepted conversations, they don't know it, but there will be a little more spectators than usual. We will mingle with the visitors after the play. Anything they say there can be used because it is a public place, and they have no right to privacy there. We already know where they are going and we have it under control. Legally, we cannot install anything in the suite that they will use, but there are many listening devices that can record through. Also, if, say, a curtain breaks and doesn't close completely, and one of us is in a position where he can see through it, then it is perfectly legal to watch and film the entire group from the beginning of the play to the end of their evening. There is no doubt that this will be enough for Roy to get a fault-based divorce and maintain the terms of the marriage contract. He sighed. There will be collateral damage. The other man and both women are married and not to either party. Tell us, Roy, how bad do you want it to be? Do you want her to go quietly, or do you want to burn her and her friends? Either option works for me. Oh, and I made an appointment with, in my opinion, the best divorce lawyer in the state on Monday morning at 10. She sent me a list of things you should bring. The most important thing is a copy of the prenuptial agreement. I had to think about it. Most of my friends didn't know because they never had a chance to see it, but when I was wronged, I could become a cruel and vindictive scoundrel. One of my first investment projects failed because my partner manipulated the money and deliberately bankrupted the business. I recovered and followed him for some time. Every time he had the opportunity to start something new, something happened that set him back again. I did this for four years before I decided I had my share of revenge. I was still thinking when Jody intervened. Don't hesitate, Roy. Be as determined as always. Put an end to this and move on. Jim added his opinion. That's right. You don't have to be secretive, Roy. Just let yourself go. His statement calmed the situation, and everyone smiled. The drinking began. I went to bed while they sang 50 ways to leave your lover at the top of their lungs. Some even guessed the words. The next morning, I was woken up by the phone ringing. Looks like my new ringtone is 50 ways to leave your lover. I suspected Jason but it made me smile. Hello. Jimmy seemed happy. Good morning, dear. How's Cleveland? It's actually much nicer than I thought it would be. Very clean, lots of parks and green spaces, and the people are friendly. But it's still Cleveland. I'll be glad to come home, and I'll be glad when you come back, dear. Well, good news. I was able to get an early morning flight. I'll probably be home by 8. This disrupted her plans a little. She'd have to cut down on her fun so she could be home when I arrived. I was hoping she would take a shower first. She was a little confused but quickly recovered. That's great. Just a reminder, I have a performance tonight. I might be a little irritable in the morning. The performance started at 8 and would end before 10 o'clock. Even with communication... She could have been home by 11.30 with no problem. I couldn't resist a little barb. Well, don't get carried away. I know your special state after the performance. I promise to behave. I must be in bed by midnight. Yes, but with whom? This went through my head when I broke the connection. Jim came in smiling. Caught her. She wasn't alone last night. While talking to you, she was in bed with a woman and the missing man from the group. He's one of the board members, a married board member. The woman is married to the DA in another county. Depending on how you want to play it, it can get very confusing quickly. There was no need to wait. I decided to act immediately after the play. During the communication, I asked, how much would it cost to have an attorney draft adultery divorce papers and file a claim to break the family bond for everyone involved? I know they won't be legally binding, but they will make a statement of intent. He looked surprised. God, once you make a decision, you don't hesitate. It will cost a pretty penny, but I can do it. Go ahead while I tell the group my plans. I called Celeste and Jody and met them for breakfast. Jody seemed a little shocked, but Celeste just smiled. Poor Jimmy. All this time, and she still doesn't know who she was married to. This will destroy them all and probably the guild. 
I doubt they can recover from the second scandal after the House of Cards collapses. I will help them start again, but I will make sure they know this is the last time. Most of us flew home together, and by the time we landed, they had their own plan. Everyone gathered to be near me for moral support. Jim brought in several new bodyguards to ensure everything was as civilized as possible. I hung out at the agency, listening to telephone conversations. Jimmy seemed to change her mind at the last minute. I think I'll skip tonight. Roy is coming home early, and I can't let him suspect anything. We're too close to the end to mess it up. This prompted a series of calls between the conspirators. Most wanted her to come, but the DA's wife persuaded her not to. You're showing common sense, dear. There's no need to ruin our game. We'll have plenty of time later. Then she laughed. Besides, it will be more for me and Janice. Good luck tonight. None of the group knew about her plans except Philip and Jack. I was going to burn them anyway. He who pays plays, Jason said, walking over with a smile. Turns out your friend Philip has a degree in computer science and works for an IT company. Once this gets out, he'll probably be out of a job. Want to have some fun? Jason spent an hour cross-hacking all of Philip's accounts. He even included a conversation about Philip and Jack being lovers, carefully removing any mention of Jimmy from his Facebook page and declaring his love for Jack to be undeniable. It turns out Philip wasn't as good as he thought because Jason followed his electronic trail and recovered every cent they had taken so far. He'll be screwed when this comes out. I wish I could see his face when I tell him I got all my money back. I just smiled. Come to the play. You'll be able to see his face when I tell him about it. The show is about to begin. I thought as I sat in the van that night. We waited until the last minute to enter, waiting for the lights to come on and the curtain to rise. I was a little surprised when I saw who my witness for the evening was, and Philip's ex-wife. I didn't recognize her right away, she had to remind me who she was. She had lost 50 pounds, and her hair was now blonde and went down to the middle of her back. It turns out that while she was married to that man, she was ending her MMA career. Her fighting name was Catherine the Great. Due to her size, she fought in the heavyweight division, and although she was never a champion, she made some good money before retiring. Unfortunately, Philip stole a lot of money from her before she discovered it. This was right after their confrontation, and she managed to keep just over half of her assets. This was the main reason why she didn't have to pay him child support. It looks like he took his share of the assets in advance. And was a strikingly attractive woman, much more attractive than I remembered. Then again, all I saw of her was her body as she slammed into me. I still remembered how her fist felt. While we were talking, I learned that she had three black belts in different styles of martial arts and was proficient in two more. She had a degree in criminal justice and worked as a police officer until she grew tired of the politics and harassment. She had been freelancing as a bodyguard until now and was happy to work with Jim, telling me she wouldn't mind a full-time job. It occurred to me that all of my investments and the friends I had made over the years were inadvertently preparing me for this situation. It wasn't something I was thinking about when I said yes. I remembered Jody's joke about my luck and smiled. Maybe she was right. Five minutes before the curtain rose, I led in out of the van, glancing briefly at her four-inch heels. How can you fight in these? She smiled. I don't wear anything with a strap. These stilettos come off easily, and I can get rid of them in a second. Sometimes, if I'm not in a hurry, I leave them on. You'd be surprised how a four-inch heel can take a fighter out of service. Good to know. Her heels meant she was three inches taller than me, but that didn't bother me. I doubted that anyone would notice me next to her. She laughed. I'm usually dressed business casual. It's nice to dress up sometimes. You seem to like it too. I told her that I completely approved of her outfit, practically eye to eye with her cleavage. Her little black dress was what she called a high-low dress, high on the hip and low on the chest. It got my vote. This also got the vote of everyone else who noticed us when we sneaked into our seats on the balcony. I looked around while the play was going on. My friends had decided to give it their all, every man in a tuxedo, every woman dressed to the nines, as they put it. Jim was with his wife, and at 45, 
she still had a killer body, and her silver hair seemed to glow. Jason was with his new bride, his little nerd, as he liked to call her. She was wearing a very cute dress, the purple color matched her hair perfectly. Celeste and Jody accompanied each other. If Jody had her way, it would have been a full-fledged date. I think this is the first time I've seen her in a dress. The dress was designed to highlight her strong body as much as possible. Celeste was, as always, stunning. We entered as the curtain rose and sat on the balcony. Jimmy didn't show up at the agency at my request. They were quite surprised when I asked them not to fire her. She didn't steal from you. I'm sure she's doing a good job, so I'd like you to keep her at least until the divorce is over. It would be hard for her to ask for support when she has a well-paying job. They agreed, though one wanted to fire her on general principles. The other, more cold-blooded partner, persuaded him not to. It all depended on how much publicity and consequences it would cause. The performance was quite good, a smaller version of My Fair Lady. I looked at Jimmy on stage, and she seemed radiant. It hurt me to see how happy she looked. I wondered what her expression would be like in about 90 minutes. Jack and Philip were the male presenters, and they received a lot of applause. The ovation lasted 15 minutes. They disappeared backstage before emerging into the foyer to receive the admiration of their fans. I had arranged for two off-duty police officers to be present to ensure nothing got out of hand and three bodyguards to act as bailiffs. Each carried a dozen red roses. Jimmy thanked the fans when she saw me, and she really seemed happy to see me. When I didn't come, she frowned and tried to make her way towards me. One of the bailiffs stopped her, saying that the roses were from a fan. Your name is Jimmy McCoy, isn't it? Yes, it is. Then this is for you too. She handed her a large brown envelope and took a photo of Jimmy holding it. You have been served. Good night. Jimmy stood there for a minute, trying to figure out what was going on, glancing at me before opening the bag. Inside were several photos from last night where she had cheated on me. Jimmy didn't say anything. She looked at me for a second, then her eyes rolled back, and she fainted. When she fell, some photos scattered, and friends trying to help her saw them. Jack seemed to want to faint too when he received a photo of himself and his wife. Jenny perhaps. The million I asked for in the alienation of feelings lawsuit might have contributed to his concerns. The DA's wife, I still can't remember her name, was rocking back and forth, saying no, no, no over and over. Janice screamed and ran out of the building. Philip's reaction was the most interesting. In addition to the lawsuit papers, there was a note in the envelope telling him that the district attorney, the one whose wife he slept with, would receive a package detailing all of his illegal activities. He dropped the envelope and looked around like crazy before focusing on me. I will kill you. He rushed towards me at full speed, but and stopped him. She smiled in his face. Hello, dear. Did you miss me? Then she hit him. It was a little over the top, but our lawyer convinced the court that it was just the adrenaline of the moment and that she thought he made a threatening move towards her client. The police and ambulance arrived. It was like deja vu, but this time it was the last time. On the advice of my lawyer, I made myself unavailable for a few days, long enough to file the actual paperwork. I never returned to the house I bought for Jimmy and didn't want it anymore. I ended up giving her $50,000, the exact amount I had added to the infidelity fund while we were married. I also gave her the house, but she also received the last 10 years of payments. I also gave her a car because I bought it for her birthday last year. In total, she received about $175,000 in assets, a good amount, but small compared to what she lost. I had a hard time understanding why she would try to rob a bank when she already had the combination safe. She just needed to stay true. Of course, she tried to justify all this. In one of our few conversations, I asked why she believed every lie and why she never checked whether it was true. She had the money to hire a private detective or, God forbid, to talk to me. She didn't have a definite answer. A week before the divorce, she gave in and signed the papers. She was still retained at the agency, but the cordial working relationship had faded, and it was obvious that she would never rise above the position she had at the time. Not surprisingly, she resigned and took a position in another city. 
It was over a year before I even started looking at other women. It took me so long to come to my senses. All my friends and business partners remained close, especially Celeste and Jody. After six months, they decided I would be fine and left me alone. I was still waking up, reaching across the bed. It takes a long time for years of love to fade into the past. This whole story made me a little nervous, so I reduced my investments for a while, consolidating cash flow. This would put me in a better position if something profitable came along. I made one more investment before cutting back. The guy who contacted me about the donut franchise called to see if there had been any progress. He was devastated when I gave him the short version of what happened. His response was to send me eight different flavors of his donuts, three dozen of each, to my office. They were stacked in front of the door when I arrived. I gathered as many people as I could for a tasting, and everyone agreed they were the best donuts they had ever tasted. Even Jod tried to steal a dozen when she left. My favorite was the molasses donut, it had to have instant artery clogging properties and contain at least 2 million calories. The guy was from Louisiana, so I flew there to check out his operation. He had one store in a small town, and it took me 40 minutes to get inside because of the customers. I bought a donut and a surprisingly good cup of coffee, another Louisiana product, heavily mixed with chicory. When the line thinned a bit, I introduced myself. The stall manager turned out to be his daughter, and she shouted back, Dad, the money man is here. The guy jumped out from behind the counter, covered in sweat, with a paper cap on his head. He was about 5 feet 3 inches in any direction you could measure, a Cajun from a small parish that no one had heard of. His speech was difficult to understand, but he glowed with enthusiasm and was impossible not to like. I tried to talk about business, but he stopped me. I make donuts. My daughter handles the business side. She thinks we could go statewide, maybe four or five more stores. You should talk to her. If she says okay, we'll go into business. We need to get back to work. I made an appointment for 6 o'clock that evening, helped myself to another molasses donut, and left. The meeting took place at her home. She treated me to a genuine Cajun dinner. Most of the dishes were really tasty, except for the extreme spiciness. Her husband, who had returned from work on an oil rig, was at dinner. They had three children ranging in age from 3 to 13, all girls. After cleaning up, we all drank coffee together, and I sat down to discuss business. The first thing I wanted to know was how he came up with the recipes and what made them so delicious. Dad makes his flavors starting with vanilla. He makes most of them in 50 food-grade canisters, and they need to sit for at least a year. If we start working together, we'll have to find a place to produce in larger volumes. This can be a problem at the start. We have enough inventory to service three stores for a year, besides ours right now. How much did you mean? She asked. She almost fainted when I told her three stores were good for a test market. But you don't realize how original your donuts taste. My vision is to have one in every city in the state with over 20,000 people. I thought we could expand to Texas, Alabama, Georgia, until we cover the South. I expect that within 10 years we can be all over the country, maybe even in international markets in select locations. How does that sound to you? It sounds too big. I'm not sure my father will agree, but we can talk to him and see. It took a month to convince him to agree to my proposal. Since I took on the financial burden, I received the lion's share of the profits. He finally agreed when I said I would include a buyout clause in the contract, 5% per year until he owned it outright. The initial agreement was 70 thirtieths, and I excluded his original store. He retained full ownership of the store. It was then difficult to get him to focus on producing enough flavors to support the stores. I had to bring in experts to explain how it works and that we needed to legally protect the recipes to prevent copycats. I included a clause in the contract that, in the future, we would consider bottling and selling flavors as a secondary business. Eight months after signing the contract, we opened a store in New Orleans. When the locals found out how good the donuts were, they tried to keep it a secret, but the advertising agency put a stop to it. They soon became so busy that we had to add a second location just to make donuts. We then opened in Shreveport and Baton Rouge. Rumors spread, especially when a Food Network star did a show about them. 
Celeste made a statement at the beginning of the show saying that she was a personal friend, and although I owned the majority of the shares, I had little to do with making the donuts. Gaston was a big fan and couldn't believe she was making a show about his small business. We ran the flavoring factory with three shifts, and they could barely keep up. Gaston insisted that they be aged for a minimum of six months, and if they did not pass his personal test, they had to be left in barrels. After we established ourselves, I hired a respected general director and appointed Gaston's daughter as his deputy. He came out of retirement to train her, and once he felt she was comfortable enough, he retired with a significantly larger pension fund. I just relaxed. I continued to monitor my investments and attended meetings, but everything was going smoothly, so I wasn't worried. I was checking out the bar, the terrible trinity, Amy, Desiree, and Tina wanted a meeting. Amy laid it all out for me. This place is a gold mine for you. We think it's time for you to expand. Other cities could benefit from what we've accomplished here. Our community is hungry for places where we can feel safe. We've done some research and found a good location. The location is great, it's a low crime area with a progressive population, so we think we'll be accepted with minimal protests. Would you consider it? We did it. Jad decided not to participate except as a limited investor. I wasn't particularly interested in this either, so I laid out the terms for them, I'll invest 30%, Jad will invest another 20%, and you'll have to find the rest yourself. We can't find that kind of money, they said. No, but you can borrow it, I replied. We don't have the credit for this. I smiled. You have it. I'll give you a loan. I'll keep the payments low, and the interest rate will be the key rate plus 1%. You can come to me for help, but it will be your business. When the tears and hugs were over, I took the documents out of my briefcase and handed them to Amy. Read them, then have the lawyer do a double check. Sign them, and you're in business. The contract had a buyout clause of 5% per year until they became full owners. I was getting ready to leave, and it was just me and Tina left in the office. Roy, can I ask you a favor? What favor? We're having a prom next month. It's for all our people who, for obvious reasons, never got to attend one in school. It's turned into a big event, we had to rent the local college gym, and we're already filling it up to capacity. Well, almost. One set of tickets is left, and we want you to go with Amy. She's in love with you at first sight. Her boyfriend just left her for a real girl. He said some pretty hurtful things to her when he left. She was really looking forward to this prom, and now she's not. Wanna go? Tina, I. Listen, we know you're not attracted to girls like us. If you were attracted, we would strangle you. But you love Amy as a friend, and many friends go to events together. Give her a good memory. I thought about this last night before going to bed. The next morning, I surprised Amy by showing up at her office. Roy, is something wrong? I took her hand. No problem, Miss Amy. Would you mind if I were your date to prom? I think I look good in a tuxedo, and I'm sure you'll be beautiful. She turned pale, and I thought she might faint, but she quickly came to her senses. She opened the door, and all six of her employees could hear us. Oh, this is so unexpected. Let me think. Yes. She threw her arms around my neck, and I felt tears on her cheek. I let her hold me for a long time before she let me go. I'm expecting a great dinner in a really nice spot, she acknowledged. See you later. I think her entire team stormed into her office as soon as I left. I had a feeling this was going to be an unproductive day. I arrived in a limousine at the appointed time. Amy was absolutely gorgeous, shiny blonde hair styled in an intricate braid, a strapless black dress that seemed molded onto her with a high slit on her right thigh. I caught a glimpse of black GS as I helped her into the limousine. We attracted attention when we entered the most expensive restaurant in town. The men looked with open lust, and the women with admiration. After a great but light dinner, we arrived at the venue. The scenery was perfect, and the food was top-notch. We took a table with Desiree and her new husband, Tina and her boyfriend, and surprisingly, Celeste and Aaron, one of the first people we met at the bar. For the first time, we took photos, first as couples, then as a group, and finally individually. 
The highlight was when Amy and I were voted prom king and queen. We shared a dance under the spotlights, and she cried throughout the song. When it was over, she stepped back and looked me in the eyes. I love you. She saw the worry on my face. Not like that, maybe. If you loved girls like I do, I'd already be wearing your ring before you knew what happened. No, I love you because you were a friend, the friend I needed when I needed it most. The friend who believes in me enough to give me money for a business and for making me believe it's okay to be myself. I kissed her. I bet she didn't expect this. When we parted, I smiled. If I loved girls like you, you would be my choice. I noticed the guy watching us with a hungry look in his eyes. Shy to the point of pain, he plucked up his courage and walked over to ask Amy for a dance. I told him to ask the lady, and she surprised him by agreeing. We watched them on the dance floor. This is Robbie. He's still trying to find himself, trying to come to terms with the fact that he likes girls like us. He has a big crush on Amy but is deathly afraid of doing anything. It looks like he's finally found the courage. They did two more dances, and I saw them take out their phones. The evening ended on a positive note. Many will remember it as the best evening of their lives. Robbie came up and hesitantly invited me to the after party. Everyone was going, but I refused. I'm leaving pretty early in the morning. I don't mind if Amy goes, as long as she has someone to look after her. Can you do that for her, Robbie? You know if anything happens to her, I'll be looking for you. He stuttered, assuring me of his intentions. As I looked at Amy, I said, you are sure. Remember, we came as friends. Go have fun. I hope to hear only good news about how the rest of the evening went. She threw herself into my arms and hugged me tightly before clinging to Robbie's hand. Celeste surprised me by asking for a ride. Her boyfriend went to another party. We got into the limousine. If the driver noticed that I left with another woman, not the one I arrived with, he didn't show it. Where are you staying? I asked. With you, she replied. I didn't make any reservations. I was going to stay with Desiree and her husband. Well, apparently, you're stuck with me. It could be worse, she answered, crawling under my arm. I kissed her cheek, and she sighed. We were without anything and in bed within minutes. It was one of the best nights of my life. I woke up to find her sitting on the sofa in the room, drinking coffee from room service. She was only wearing one of my shirts. She looked unsure, but I kissed her, and she relaxed. You must have coffee for me, too, I said. She smiled and poured me a cup from a jug I hadn't noticed before. We sat in comfortable silence until our cups were empty, then the questions began. What happened last night? She asked, grinning. Fate, I replied. How do you feel? When she stopped laughing, she told me that I had spent too much time with the wrong girls. My feelings, dear, are that we get along well together. I have no qualms in telling you that I've wanted you for years. I've also seen the way you look at me when you think I'm not looking. Admit it, we have good chemistry. I don't want to ruin our friendship. To hell with friendship, I said. I'm looking for something deeper, and we both know it. I'm not getting any younger, and my window is closing. I want two children, three if the first two are the same intim, then I'll be finished. You need to think about it. I don't need an answer right now. We need to get used to each other. Last night was a good start, and I expect there will be at least one more time before I have to fly. It sounded better than talking, so I did it. The courtship lasted four months. I didn't do much at the time except watch the money roll in. She continued to star in the show and tour in support of her book. I accompanied her several times until I learned that when Celeste works, she really works. She spent five hours signing books and taking photos, refusing to leave until the last book was closed and everyone was happy. She introduced me as her partner several times. I knew she meant business partner, or at least that's what I thought, but everyone just assumed we were life partners. Small displays of personal affection may have changed their perceptions a little. We had an intim a lot. We made love a lot. We did everything we could think of, and by we, I mean her. Most of it was quite enjoyable, but some things I wouldn't even try. We talked a lot about our pasts. 
Her background was much more varied than mine. We spent about an hour discussing her days. I'm sure you know it was 90% Jack, but he's convincing, and after a while, I started to enjoy it. However, deep down, I always knew that as soon as I let another man touch me, the clock would start ticking. It may sound fun and playful, but it can be a pretty lonely life. She took a deep breath. Still, bygones are bygones. Relationships after Jack have always been monogamous. Then she pressed herself against me. I don't promise you this, I guarantee it. If we end up together forever, it will be just like this forever. No others. Till death do us part, and I mean it. I still hesitated. I was pretty sure I'd always had a little crush on Celeste. Her past scared me a little, and sometimes when we were together, I wondered if she was thinking about past lovers. I've never had such a problem. If I was with a woman, I would be completely immersed in the present. I tried to give my partner everything she wanted. True, sometimes in strange moments, I remembered what we did and thought about how I did the same thing with someone else and how it was always better with her. My hesitation began to put pressure on our relationship. She dropped a lot of hints the last time we were together, and I didn't respond as well as I could have. She left suddenly, and I didn't see her for two weeks. Then one night, I saw headlights coming up my driveway. I bought several acres near a lake that I liked so much. I couldn't get to the shoreline, but I secured access to the lake. I had a motorboat that I rarely used, preferring to get out on the water in the quiet of the early morning in my kayak. I would get a good run of paddling and get out of the lake before the big boats made it too rough. My home was a cedar ranch style with four bedrooms and many amenities, including a pool and hot tub. I was ready to step into the hot tub, so I put on my robe and went out to see who had arrived. My heart skipped a beat when I saw it was Celeste, and then I realized there was someone else with her. It was Anne. Celeste had taken her as a security guard on book tours several times because she had a stalker. They had become friends. Celeste had been drinking, it was obvious. And simply smiled and said that they happened to be nearby and decided to stop by. Celeste laughed when she saw my robe and realized that I was without clothes underneath. Yay, bath. Come on, Annie. She slowly slid her gorgeous body into the tub, sighing. Oh, this feels so good. Come on, guys, I said. I turned to apologize to Anne, and my jaw dropped. And was undressing as quickly as Celeste, but she was behind me, and I didn't notice. As she walked past, she grabbed my hand and practically dragged me into the bath. I didn't have time to take off the robe, and soon it began to feel like a weight, so I stood up and threw it off. Celeste stopped laughing and looked me straight in the eyes. This is my last attempt to make you commit. Since you didn't commit to me, I'm still free. If you commit, it will be my last time with a woman. If not, it will be my last time with you. Either way, I want us to have a good time. Stop thinking and start loving. I thought about it for about two seconds. Celeste was right. We hadn't officially declared ourselves exclusive. If we wanted to have fun with someone else, we were all free to do so and it wouldn't hurt anyone. I had to admit that the next day I was so exhausted I could barely move. I woke up, stood at the foot of the bed, dressed, and washed. Thank you, Roy. I always wondered what it would be like to be in bed with you and Celeste, and now I know, and said with a thoughtful smile. That was my last outburst. Roy, if you can't commit or if you don't love her, let her go. She has such a hot and loving personality that she will quickly find someone else. I stood up, forgetting that I was without anything, and left the bed without Celeste waking up. I looked at myself and grinned. It was nothing that and hadn't already seen up close. Just a second. I'll be right back. I went to my safe, entered the combination, and took out a small box. I opened it, and Anne's eyes widened. Celeste, dear, wake up and say goodbye to Anne, I said. She grumbled as she opened one eye. I hope the ring looked huge so close to her face. I have made a decision, dear. If you agree, I would like to. She rushed at me so quickly that we fell to the floor in a tangle of blankets while and took pictures of us with her phone. She immediately posted decent photos, and within 30 minutes, the phones were ringing. 
I was looking through wedding cards and found one without a name. It read, I always knew you and Celeste would end up together. I hope she makes you happy. Best wishes, Jimmy. Jimmy disappeared for a while after leaving the agency. One day, she returned with a new man. Their relationship lasted about six months. She disappeared again, and when she returned, she started her own agency. Her former bosses handed her small tasks, which she assigned to projects that required more resources than she could provide. She married a guy she met while working on his campaign, and after a year of dating, they got married. I gave them a wedding gift, 1% ownership of a donut franchise. This may not sound like much, but it was a nice addition to my annual income. She found it to be my most profitable project, and I felt some guilt for taking it from her. They now have a little girl. Jack simply disappeared after being accused of ruining someone else's relationship, and even and doesn't know where he is. She could find out if she wanted to, but she just never had a reason to. Philip got into a worse situation. I didn't press charges because I would have to blame Amy. She was never an organizer, just a gullible and insecure woman. They only managed to steal about $20,000, and I gave it all back. I sent his bosses a detailed report on how he used company computers and resources for illegal activities, and he was fired instantly. Making the reason for his dismissal public knowledge, not a single reputable company wanted to touch it. He went into the dark web for a while, hijacking unsecured computers and ransoming them until he made a mistake and hacked into a famous writer's computer. This writer's publisher put all their resources into finding him, and when they did, they turned him over to the feds. He received seven years and was a month away from parole when he got into an altercation with another inmate. He had to serve the entire sentence plus 18 months. I wondered from time to time how he managed in prison with his slight figure and handsome face. I think he threw himself into whatever role was asked of him. Celeste saw me with a card and asked who it was from. I threw it in the trash. An old business acquaintance. She smiled knowingly. I know something you don't know. Smile. What happened? I'm ten days late. Tomorrow I'll buy a pregnancy test at home. What do you think of our second half of the story? It seems to me that the situation in the extreme changed by the end of the second part and fortunately not in favor of the wife. What's your impression? Let me know in the comments. See you in the comments.